Greetings friends, welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. I do thank you for taking time in your busy day to watch your videos. I do pray our studies in the Word of God, studies in the history of faith, be a blessing to those who are following along. The Lord is continuing to bless more and more that are following us on Facebook and it is a great burden. For I know that there are many needs amongst you. Friends, I am powerless to help you. Some look upon us and they have the impression that we're well to do, that we're rich, but I can assure you that we're not. I do not have a uh, elaborate uh, resources to, to call upon, to send aid to many people across the world. My, the bounds of my habitation are set of God. I do good to travel from here to the nearest city to work every week and to travel even a greater distance as we did here this recently to preach in another city at a church. Took planning and effort and the grace of God to be able to get there. We thank the Lord for making it possible for us to go to our sister church and preach to them about 150 miles away. And uh, it was a blessing. And it was a, a, just a blessing to have any opportunity to stand before a congregation and preach the word of God. And the Lord does continue to provide us with opportunities to preach to churches here and nearby. And we're thankful for that. But friends, those of you in many parts of the world, especially in Africa and other places, you desire us to come unto you, and we just we don't have the ability to do that. It is not uh, for traveling from here to there is not free, and uh, it takes great resources, great effort. But we do know there are those reaching out unto you from other different uh, groups of us, and we pray, Lord, bless them and help them to get the gospel out. And those that are coming to you in person that will come to you in person, that is, that God will bless their efforts, the churches be established, that the people be set in order according to the scriptures, they might worship God, spirit, and truth. Friends, we continue to look <coughs> here at the Trinity of God, the three that are one. And as always, we start with this foundational text here out of 1 John chapter 5. Friends, there are those that debate about this. They say, well, it should be a part of the Word of God. They say, well, it's not prevalent in Greek texts. But they forget. Those who look at just the Greek forget that there are many ancient languages which the Word of God was translated over into before the 3rd and 4th centuries. And this text is found in those ancient languages, the, Latin, the old Latin being one of them. It was prevalent in it. There's over 10,000 manuscripts that show that this verse belongs here. That along with the other ancient languages and uh, history that brings us up to this, that it ought to be here. Here again we read this. <clears throat> it says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. And whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Friends, let me say this to you. The trying of your faith worketh patience. And we all go through many trials and temptations and tribulations in this life. And all of that is so that you can overcome the world by faith. And if you get hung up in this rut of expecting someone to come and help you, rather than looking to God to give you strength to contend for the faith, and by the means which He would make you able to provide for yourself, you're not depending upon the Lord, you're depending upon others. And <clears throat> we ought not then go and begin to run others down. It's all oh, you should have helped us. You should have helped us. When it's the Lord we're rebuking. Whatever we say against our brothers and sisters of faith, we're saying against the Lord. And we're saying the Lord has refused to help us. We're showing we have lack of faith. We need to have faith that God will help us in time of need, not that he'll give us an abundance and have things overflowing to where we can't we have more than what we need, but that God will give us what we need, for he does. He goes on to say, Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood, and is the Spirit 
that beareth witness because the Spirit is truth. Uh, we back way back in the beginning of this, we thoroughly covered the Holy Spirit of God and showing how the Holy Spirit of God points us to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of God, Emmanuel even, God with us. He was God, He is God. And that Holy Spirit of God lifts Him up before the people of this world that people might be drawn unto Him. It goes on to say, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And it is this particular verse that critics and those that are unbelieving in the days in which we live, that do not believe and trust the Word of God, they want to pen knife and take this out, but it is there. It's in those ancient languages, and it ought to be there. It is there by the grace of God. And it bears witness to this fact that in heaven there are three distinct witnesses of the working plan and purpose of God in our salvation. God the Father, the Word which is Jesus Christ or God the Son, and the Holy Ghost, also called the Holy Spirit. They're the same thing. And these three are, yes, one thrice holy God. And this thrice holy God is made up of these three distinct persons. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and blood, and these three agree in one. What do they agree about? We find that in the next verse. It says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. This all pertains to the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, the one for whom they look for, but yet they refuse to receive him, fulfilling scripture. This same Jesus called a man by the name of Saul to the ministry and he received the name, Christian name of Paul and we've been considering his witness in the book of Acts here in the last few videos in Acts chapter 26 we continue there. The witness of Paul as he stands before Agrippa and Festus proclaiming unto them the working of God in his life, how that God had saved him and had used him to send the gospel, or preach the gospel. And we pick this up here again in Acts chapter 26 and verse 22 where it says, Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer, and that he should be first to be, uh, that should be raised from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Recently, one person commented on the Facebook page that it was not necessary for anything to die. God did not need to kill anything to save us, showing his complete ignorance in the scriptures. Not understanding that which even is shown in types and shadows in the Old Testament and the whole, even from the beginning that the, after the fall of Adam and Eve that God killed animals and gave them skins of animals. Blood was shed because of sin. And without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. We need to understand that. And by shedding of blood it means something is sacrificed. Something is killed. And so throughout the Old Testament we see the institution of the temple and the shedding of blood, the bulls and goats and all this stuff that was necessary under the law that it be brought to pass to please God. They say, but God had no pleasure in these things. No, because they were not able to take away the sin. They are not able to do away with the sin. But they are all types and shadows pointing to the perfect Lamb of God that should take away the sin of the world. And how should he do this? But even as it was prophesied that he should suffer, that he should suffer for the sins of the people. Not only that, but that he should be, that he should die. He must needs die, and if he did not die, we would not have salvation. But yet there are those that deny this, or those that hate this teaching, they hate the plain simplicity of the gospel, that it was necessary for the Christ to come, to suffer, bleed, and die, that he then might be risen from the grave. And in through him we have the hope of salvation, in that he hath suffered once for all, and took upon him all our sins. 
Oh, I see so many out there that want to single out. So, oh, but this sin wasn't covered. This sin wasn't paid for. He either paid for all your sins, or he didn't pay for any. If there be but one sin in your life, you're guilty of the whole law, is what the scriptures say. And if there be one sin uncovered, it was not paid for, it was not washed away by the shed blood of Christ, one sin we're, we're not redeemed of, it is enough then to condemn us to hell, and there is no more sacrifice. No more sacrifice such as what was done through the Old Testament in the temple. No more coming down from heaven. He will not come down again to sacrifice himself again. He is not sacrificed every week or every time the supper is uh, observed. This is heresy. But he died once for all there on Mount Calvary some about almost 2,000 years ago now for the sins of us all. He took upon him our sins. He who knew no sin became sin for us because he took upon him our sins, suffering in our place on the cross, suffering the death we deserve, suffering the wrath of God poured out upon him that we deserve. He took our place. He was then buried in the belly of the earth three days and three nights to fulfill the prophets, to fulfill what was prophesied of him, that all things must needs have been fulfilled, and if even one thing was left unfulfilled, then he's not the Savior. And that is, he says, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead. First born among many brethren. He is our assurance. He is our salvation. He is our propitiation. He is that one who has interceded for us. He is our great high priest. He is yet, even as we know, at the right hand of the throne of God. There where he is interceding for us. As Satan would bring forth railing accusations against us all. Christ shows the scars in his hands. Scar in the side. The blood has washed away the sin. There is no more sin to be found, to be understood, to be laid against us. And when Satan brings railing accusation, they say we see no sin. The Father and the Son both say we see no sin. It's paid for. The law is satisfied. The righteousness of God is satisfied in and through His Son, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which has taken away the sins of the world. And then he says that, that should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. He distinguishes this here by the people. He's talking about the people of Israel, the children of Israel. That chosen nation to be the oracles of God, to preserve the word of God throughout time, according to God's purpose in all things, that the word of God would be preserved even unto the end of this world. And not just to them, but also to we Gentiles who were strangers to the covenants of promise and without God in the world, God hath had mercy upon us. He sent to us, first of all Paul, and then others, as the gospel spread throughout the world. Many have turned against it these days. They begin to fall away, beginning to go back to the ways of this world, look to the false ways. But these things were known, even as he begins to speak of these things, as he laid all this out here, and it begins to say, and it says, And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. Some do get so caught up in reading this, and without the Spirit of God, to give you understanding. One can take this and they don't see the truth it's right before them. It, it, they, it, their mind corrupts it. It either it casts it aside or if they try to comprehend these things without the Holy Spirit of God leading them. And let me say to you that if you look into this and you get an interpretation different from what others believe, then you've got a private interpretation, and it's not the truth. What we said here and preach unto you is believed and goes all the way back to the apostles, the things which we teach. 
even as Paul taught these things and proclaimed these things, we proclaim the same things that Paul was proclaiming. Verse by verse, word by word, in context, setting before you the word of God. Too many take things out of context, try to make a statement here, a statement over there, say something that is not being taught in either place or anywhere else in the word of God. The prophecies of old all pointed to Calvary. All pointed to the Savior suffering, bleeding, and dying. Shedding his blood there on Calvary to redeem us from all our sins. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb had to be sacrificed. Our gospel now that we have points back to Calvary. Declaring that which has been fulfilled of God, even our salvation, in and through his death, burial, and resurrection. They looked forward to his appearing, not uh, it being in types and shadows, not fully revealed unto them. They did not know the name by which he would come. They did not know the fullness of the purpose and what he would do. It was not fully revealed unto them. But they looked forward to it. We, again, we look back to it. The mysteries, those things which were in shadows and things hid to them, are now revealed fully by God. The plan and purpose of God to send His only begotten Son into the world. That through His death, burial, resurrection, and belief upon Him, we might be saved. And no longer be under the condemnation of God in the law. We must believe upon Him to be saved. We're already condemned. All people are already condemned because we are sinners, we're transgressors of the law. Salvation is only of the Lord in and through Jesus Christ. Faith in Him. Not of works, lest any should boast. Now, much learning does make some people mad. It puts them in a condition to where they believe things and they, again, they take things out of context and they listen to the opinions and traditions of men. This is what's wrong with much of the teaching in the world today. Traditions of men that are contrary to the very word of God itself. Oh, but they're holy men. They're, they're of the church. No, they're of the world. And their traditions are of the world. They're not of God. Not founded in scripture. They are mad. They're deceived. And they deceive millions by their false doctrines. Paul said unto him, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. The word of God is truth. Outside this here book, there is no truth to be found that could do anything for you. God's holy word, the scriptures, beginning of Genesis to the end of the book of Revelation is the revealed word of God unto us, the scriptures, the word of God given to us by inspiration and preserved even over into this English language that we should believe upon him. Those of power and influence certainly speak ill of Christianity. And even as Festus here accused Paul of being mad, being beside himself with too much learning. Still yet, Paul compliments him, calls him noble. Most noble Festus. He and Agrippa being in positions of authority and power. Paul understands this. He says, I speak words of truth and soberness. Truth is set before us. And if we approach it with a sober mind, a desire to learn, a desire to comprehend what is set before us here, God will give us understanding. He says then in verse 26, For the king knoweth these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things were hid from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest, he says. He was a proselyte. He was a devotee or a believer of the Jewish religion, Jewish teachings. 
And he knew what their writings said. Their they, writings predicted, they spoke of a Messiah, the Christ, that should come to set the people free. They were looking for a man to come and establish again the kingdom of Israel, that they might be an independent state again, be out from under the thumb of a Gentile nation, even Rome itself. But in saving them, that's not the purpose of God. That, or that, what they thought was not the purpose of God, but he came to save his people from their sins. And these things that came to pass, even this Jesus of Nazareth, this one who went about to doing such mighty works, Agrippa was well understanding of it. He knew about it all. He knew what they had done in the early morning hours of that day when they broke their own laws to try him in secret and began to bring him to that point of death on Calvary. He knew what had been done. This is all the others had. But Agrippa was well versed in their teachings and their traditions. He knew. He believed that their traditions were right. Agrippa said unto him, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. Too many out there are almost persuaded to be a Christian don't want to give up your traditions. don't want to give up your foolish way of living and thinking, pleasing yourself rather than yielding yourself unto God as a living sacrifice. You might be pleasing unto Him and that you would live for Him. Almost, he said. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. That's a name, again, at Antioch. It's where they were first called Christians meant that they were followers of Christ. Desire to be like him who had come to redeem them from all their sins, to be Christ-like, to be acceptable unto God, to be pleasing in the sight of God. Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. Oh, that all would receive the gospel, the good news, of the Savior, the Christ that has come to save us from our sins. That we would put our faith and trust in Him for our salvation and not our works, not your membership in any religious organization, not the baptism which you would take part in, not the Lord's Supper, which you would take part in, but salvation by the grace of God through faith in His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. For there is none other name given whereby we must be saved. And to those of you that have been deceived and dragged back down into the muck and mire of tradition to look to another name, you've cursed yourselves. You've cursed yourselves because you've turned from the only name given whereby we must be saved. Oh, but where they're looking for an old Hebrew name, there was no name given in the Hebrew to be saved by. It was not revealed in the Hebrew, the name to be saved by. Oh, yes, there's many names of God there, but you cannot be saved by those names. But in the Greek, it was manifest and declared by Jesus. By the name of Jesus, by Jesus, by believing upon Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the only begotten Son of God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way. The only way to God the Father. The Jews and Gentiles even that still worship the Jehovah God, or whatever name you want to call him, even these modern names which are now thrown around today, which are not the God of the Bible, but Jehovah is not the name given whereby you must be saved. Nor will any of those Old Testament names save you. They are not the name in which you must trust and believe. But you must trust in Jesus. Through Him is the only way to the Father. Jesus is the only truth that you need to understand. No truth apart from Him. And in Him is the only life that you can hold on to and have assurance of. For all other ways lead unto death, 
by tradition and by deception of men, they lead unto death. Only in and through Jesus Christ can there be life everlasting, believing upon him to the saving of your souls. Oh, that all that hear these words, or not almost, but all together, all together believers in Jesus Christ, Christians, looking to the coming and appearing again of that Savior who is coming back, my friends, will he find you faithful? Will he find you watching and looking for his return? Or will he find you caught up in the tradition and the muck and the mire of this world, being led by the blind? Because you're also blind, and you can't see where you're going. You can't see that the traditions of men have deceived you, and they're leading you off into the pit that is hell itself. Friends, lest you repent and turn from your ways, Turn from the traditions of men. Turn to God in faith and repentance. You'll go to hell. You're going to die in your sins. Oh, but they say God loves us and he's already paid for our sins. That's tradition. Tradition teaches that. God so loved the world as it was when he created it, perfect without sin, that he planned and purposed to send his only begotten son into the world to save a people for his namesake amongst all mankind. And the Bible says there be few that find that way of salvation. Few. The vast majority of you by tradition and by deception of men are walking right off into the pit of hell where you'll suffer forever and ever. But I would to God that you were almost, not just almost, but altogether a believer in these things. He goes on to say, And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. We see the providence of God in this. God said, I called you to go unto Rome, to stand before kings, and bear witness of me. He's on his way to Rome. He's already stood before this king, and he'll stand before the emperor of Rome itself. More than one, even while he's there. Bearing witness to rulers, people in high positions of authority, of the salvation of the Lord. If they would but repent and believe, they could be saved. We look at this in the life of Paul lived, and the idea that he went down into Jerusalem knowing that he'd be put into bonds, and he, his life was not, uh, he did not consider his life. He was willing to give his life for the cause of Christ. But we see in this the providence of God that in his appeal to Caesar, guaranteed he would go unto Rome and stand before Rome because all the power and the authority of the governors and the king had to protect him and get him there now because he had appealed unto Caesar and as a Roman citizen he had that right friends we're again running out of time all of us are day by day we're running out of time the end is upon us great tribulation is coming the rapture will occur and people like me will no longer be here. May God bless and keep you, my friends.